Have you personally received the Holy Spirit? Now, to make it a little clearer to all of us, maybe I should say, I'm not asking you, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit? I understand we, we all have various ideas about that, being filled with the Holy Spirit or being baptized with the Holy Spirit. Some of us think that occurs all in one ball of wax, as we say in America. We get the whole ball of wax at once when we become Christians. Some of us feel that way, and that's all right. Others of us feel, no, you're baptized with the Holy Spirit maybe two years, maybe three years after you are become a Christian. But I'm not asking that, loved ones. I'm asking, have you received the Holy Spirit? Just received Him. Maybe you're not yet filled with Him. Maybe you're not baptized with Him. But have you received the Holy Spirit personally? And you may say, well, I mean, I'm a Christian. And uh, of course I've received the Holy Spirit. I mean, I must have, mustn't I? Uh, Because I am a Christian. I'm regarded as a disciple of Christ. And so I take it I've received the Holy Spirit. And yet, loved ones, do you see that there are examples in the New Testament of people who were regarded as disciples, actually as Christian disciples, And yet they had not received the Holy Spirit. And why I'm sharing this with you is not to kind of get at you and prove, oh, now you're not really a Christian, but I think that many of you who are Christians feel you lack something in your Christian life. And often when I share with you the victorious life, You know, victory over anger and envy and jealousy. And I talk to you about dying with Christ. And I talk to you about being filled with the Holy Spirit and having victory over sin of all kinds. Often some of you who believe you're Christians, when you hear that message, you just, oh, you're like kind of withered flowers. You just think, oh, no, I could I. I can't be that. Oh, you want me to try more. You want me to try to overcome my sin. Oh, Pastor, I I love you and I want to be that, but I can't. I, I can't work up the strength to do it. And many of us who think of ourselves as Christians, when this message that we can be delivered from self and delivered from the power of sin and live above anger and jealousy and envy, when that message is preached to us, instead of us finding a rising in our hearts to it, we find kind of a heaviness about us. Now, here's the point. When you've received the Holy Spirit, even if you're just a little child in God, even if you're only a little baby in Jesus, even if it happened only yesterday, when you receive the Holy Spirit at conversion, and some happy soul comes along to you and preaches this glorious victory over even inward anger and jealousy, the Holy Spirit within you rises to that. He rises to that. Because He knows He's able to bring that about in your life. And so you sense a rising to it. Now, you sense an inability too, but the rising is stronger than the inability. And even though you may feel at times terrible, and the conviction of sin may get unbearable, yet always there will be that bright little light inside you that will keep saying, yes, yes, but I can do it in you. I can do it through you. Now, if you haven't received the Holy Spirit, when you were born of God, if somehow or other you've got into some kind of half-baked experience and you haven't received the Holy Spirit, then when somebody like me preaches victory over sin and the baptism with the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the Holy Spirit and victory over even inward anger and jealousy and envy, then there'll be no rising in your heart. You'll just valiantly and kind of bravely feel just because you love me or you've listened for so many Sundays, you'll feel, well, I ought to try to do that. But on the whole, it'll be a depressing message to you. On the whole, you'll kind of feel, 
Oh, I, I couldn't. I can hardly make it as I am over outward sin. What are you talking about inward sin about? Now, do you see that? So that's why I'm sharing this with you. So that you'll know where you are. Now, in fact, there were people in the New Testament who were regarded as Christian disciples, thought of themselves as Christian disciples, and hadn't received the Holy Spirit. Now, let me show you them, uh, where they're mentioned. Uh, It's in Acts chapter 19. Acts 19. Acts chapter 19. It's verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. And he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have never even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, Into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Because, of course, that was the baptism with the Holy Spirit that they came into. But the point was that they hadn't even received the Holy Spirit in any form before that. And so, it seems to me many of us are like that. Whether we have to go on and be baptized with the Holy Spirit and filled with the Holy Spirit all at once, or whether we have to go on and just receive the Holy Spirit and then walk as many of us have had for a year or so until we're filled with the Holy Spirit, many of us, it seems to me, loved ones, are in the same position as these people in regard to the Holy Spirit we haven't really received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, some of us get confused because we think, yes, but we have gone through some of the things that are connected with Christian conversion. And uh, maybe you'd look back to that chapter that Leighton read in the New Testament lesson. It's Acts chapter 2. And you get there the clear direction given after the very first Christian sermon that was ever preached, the first direction as to how you become a Christian. And I think some of us have gone through some of these things. It's Acts 2 and 38. It's page 949. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, it seems to me that there are many of us here that have in some sense repented. You see, there are five elements here, if you notice. There's repentance, and there's being baptized, and there's in the the name of Jesus Christ, and there's the forgiveness of sins, and there's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And many of us, I think, have come through some of those things. Many of us have repented in some sense. Many of us have been baptized either as children or even as adults in Baptist churches or been confirmed in some way. Some of us have believed in the name of Jesus Christ. Some of us have experienced the forgiveness of our sins. But could it be that some of us have not received the gift of the Holy Spirit? In other words, could it be that you have come through some of the experiences that involve becoming a Christian, but you have not entered into the vital one, which is the gift of the Holy Spirit? That's the new thing. I don't know if you realize it, but all the other things except for Jesus, three of the other five elements were in the Old Covenant. People repented in the Old Covenant. People experienced the forgiveness of their sins in the Old Covenant. Psalm 103 says, Blessed is the man whose sins are covered, to whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. 
Do you know where that peace comes from? He has removed our transgressions as far as we're from the east is from the west. So far as He removed our transgressions from us, it comes from Psalm 103, from the Old Covenant. So the Old Covenant had an experience of forgiveness of sins. The Old Covenant had an experience of repentance. The Old Covenant even had an experience of some kind of circumcision or baptism. Because you remember, John the Baptist baptized people for the forgiveness of their sins. What the Old Covenant didn't have was Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And it's the gift of the Holy Spirit that makes you a Christian. Now, I wonder why some of us may not have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, loved ones, I think, if you look back to Acts 19... I think it's because some of us may have entered into this kind of an experience that these people did when Apollos baptized them. You see into verse 3 there of Acts 19. Acts 19 is page 966 and verse 3. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. That's the old covenant baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. And then Paul adds, that is Jesus. But what Apollos did was, he did the same as John. He said, repent, and God will forgive you your sins, and come down to the river, and I'll baptize you in the name of him who is to come. I'll baptize you in the name of the Messiah who will eventually come and deliver us. I wonder how many of us here have entered into that kind of general experience of conversion. In other words, Jesus is not very vital to us in our Christian conversion. Now, I'll tell you how it can come about. I think there are many of us have been brought up in church. We believe all the things that Christians believe. We think they're good. We believe in church and we come to church. And actually we believe in God and we pray to God. And we believe that He oversees all of our lives and that we should try to be like Him. And that's as far as our conversion goes. That's as far as it goes. We talk about the Lord. We do. In everyday life. We'll say, oh, the Lord did this, or the Lord does that, or I think the Lord wants me to do that, or, well, I'm trusting the Lord for this. But we don't mean the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our personal friend and Savior. We mean, generally, the Lord the way they meant They were baptized in the name of Him who was to come. We don't know who that is, but we're baptized in the name of Him who is to come. And to us, the Lord is a general term that means God. And we are, in fact, theists. That is, we're like many people who aren't particularly Christian. We believe in God. We respect God. We're theists. That's what a theist is. He's a believer in God. But we don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. We don't know Jesus as our dear friend. And Jesus is not very vital in our experience. In other words, we have the experience of repentance, to some extent of baptism or confirmation, to some extent the forgiveness of our sins, but Jesus is not very real to us and not very vital. And when we talk about the Lord, we talk about the Lord in the same way much as a follower of Islam would talk about the Lord. Or a Buddhist at times will even talk about the Lord. Or a spiritualist even will talk about certain lords. We talk in a general term, uh, the Lord. But we don't mean the dear Lord Jesus Christ, who is our dear personal friend and Savior, whom we know face to face. Now, loved ones, I think some of us can come in to a general relationship with God 
that does not involve Jesus in any way. Actually, I think some of us are even in a more subtle position. I think some of us were in real trouble with drugs at one time, or with alcohol, or in real trouble with our marriages, or real trouble with our careers. And we were desperate, and we needed delivered, and we cried out to God in agony, God, help me. And God graciously came down and delivered us out of our troubles. And we have a great sense of gratitude to God as in some sense our Savior. But Jesus is not dear and personal to us. It's just a general sense that if you knew what God did for me so many years ago, then you'd believe in Him like I do. But it's believing in God as a providential deliverer, not as a Savior from sin and hell. And because Jesus is again lacking in our experience, we have not received the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, loved ones, it's only if Jesus is dear and precious to you that you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He gives the gift of the Holy Spirit personally to you. Now, if you say to me, well, brother, I mean, how do I come to that? A real conviction of sin, loved ones. That's the only thing. That's the only thing will drive you to Jesus. That's the only thing will drive you into His arms. If you allow the Holy Spirit to convict you deeply, of your helplessness and hopelessness before God. And I remember doing that, you know, I was so anxious to find reality with God that I just read the Bible and I saw, yes, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that's me and it's you. We've fallen short of God's glory and the wages of sin is death. That's it. It's death. There's no other solution. There's no other answer to it. Death is the only answer to sin. And if you, you know, if you have failed in even one point of the law, the Bible says you're guilty of all of it. I mean, if you haven't stolen, but you've had unclean thoughts, then it's as if you've stolen and killed and murdered and everything. So it doesn't matter what little falling short there has been. If you've fallen short at all, you are due death eternally. And you are due the fires of hell. And until you see that, you will not feel that any great change is needed, such as Jesus alone can bring. But as you allow the Holy Spirit to begin to convince you that you are a helpless and a hopeless sinner, and that there is no way in which you can please God, that it is to him that worketh not, but believeth that him that justifieth the ungodly, that he will declare your righteousness, your faith is declared as righteousness, only when you see that will God begin to be able to make Jesus real to you. In other words, you need to see that you are hopeless and helpless, that you are shot through with selfishness, that your anger is just evidence of a rebellion against God that is deeper than anything you can see, that you just want your own way and you're determined to trample over anybody to get it, that your your life is full of lies and dishonesty and bearing false witness against your neighbor and anger and sarcasm, and that all those things are sins and that God cannot let you into his heaven with those. And the only thing he can do with you is destroy you and cast you into hell forever. Unless Jesus has gone there for you. And loved ones, as you begin to realize that Jesus has gone to hell for you and he has borne no sins in his own body on the tree for you and allowed God his Father to destroy those sins in him, only when you see that do you grab for Jesus as your only hope in utter self-abasing repentance You grab for him desperately and you say, Lord Jesus, I'll do anything. I'll get rid of any of the things that have caused your death on Calvary. Show me them and I'll get rid of them. And you turn from yourself utterly and completely. And when you've done that, you realize there's nothing inside. 
because you've turned away from everything that was you. And then it is that Jesus says, I will give you the Holy Spirit, my counselor, and he will come into your heart and he will be your... Now receive him now as you would receive me and begin to attend to him and listen to him and obey him. And as you do that, the Holy Spirit grows and grows within you and becomes more and more real to you. And loved ones, the Holy Spirit begins to take Jesus' own character and to make it real inside you. The Holy Spirit is a real person. He isn't just a force. He isn't just an influence. He isn't just what we call you changing your mind. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He comes into your life And He is a real whole person inside you. He is a mind. He is a mind like yours. He has emotions like yours. He has a will like yours. He's a real person inside you. He can give you thoughts that you have not got. He can give you His own desires. He can beget His own wishes in you. And as you make room for Him more and more in your life, the Holy Spirit begins to give you the very character of Jesus. And He begins to light that character up for you. Somebody has said the Holy Spirit is the one who takes the things that happened 2,000 years ago and He makes them living realities here today in your life. And you know we've used the illustration before. It's like coming into the art gallery in London and seeing all the magnificent paintings around the walls. And you come in at night, and the custodian says, Oh, you should see, you should see that beautiful painting of Rembrandt there, and the one by Gainsborough, it's magnificent. And you say, Oh, I wish I could see it, but it's dark in here. It's like that. Before the Holy Spirit is received into your life, I talk up here about things of God and you kind of try to imagine them, you know. You try to think, oh yeah, 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 I think I felt that. I think I know what that feels like. And then the custodian says, wait a minute, I'll turn the lights on. And he turns the lights on and you see all the magnificent paintings for the first time and all the beauty of it thrusts in upon your mind and your eyes. It's like that when you receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit suddenly takes all the magnificent things of God and of Jesus and He makes them real to you. Makes them real so that you'll understand them. Never fear. Don't think it'll just be so that I understand them or somebody else. He knows you. He adapts it to your understanding. The Holy Spirit takes the things of Jesus and makes them real to you. He changes your own life. He changes your life. Do you remember the time that Jesus went to that house? And I think it was Mary Magdalene, maybe. You remember the one who was a prostitute. I think it was her that came in with a box, you remember, of perfumed ointment. And she washed his feet. You remember they used to wash their feet when they came in from the dusty roads. And then she dried them with her hair. And then she broke the box of ointment to put it on his feet. And then, you remember in John 12, it says, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the ointment. Now, when we talk about the anointing of the Holy Spirit, or the anointment of the Holy Spirit, that's what he does. He fills your own life with the fragrance of Jesus' beauty. And your conscience becomes something sweet, And your thoughts become something beautiful. And they are filled with a fragrance of Christ's love and His joy. And you find that rising from within you. So that it comes up from within. You don't know where it's come from. You haven't produced it yourself. It isn't because you read a book that teaches you to think a certain way. It's just a spontaneous rising from within you of the beautiful thoughts that Jesus is having at the right hand of God. The Holy Spirit fills your life with the fragrance of Jesus and, of course, fills every place where you go with the fragrance of Jesus. Your home begins to sense the sweetness in your whole life. Your business 
people begin to sense a fragrance about you that they can't explain. There's a sweetness comes into the relationships that you have and the conversations you have. A kind of heavenly spiritual thing that nobody can define. But the Holy Spirit brings it about in your life. The Holy Spirit does those things. The Holy Spirit anoints you with the beauty and the strength of Jesus. Now, that's why it's so vital to receive the Holy Spirit. And you remember, uh, Paul says in Galatians, did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law or by faith? And of course he implies you received the Holy Spirit by faith. You received the Holy Spirit by faith. That's it. Not by feeling. Not by feeling. Have I got the Holy Spirit? You'll never feel him. He isn't emotion. You receive him by faith. You simply say, Lord Jesus, you said if I was baptized and repented in your name for the forgiveness of my sins, I would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, I want to receive that gift of the Holy Spirit now, clearly today, so that from now on I can begin to listen to him and can begin to obey him and allow him to grow within me. And loved ones, even if you do that in cold blood today, God will honor you. God will honor you. If you simply do that plainly and simply this morning, Jesus will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then as you listen to the Holy Spirit, He will show you more and more things in your life. And if you trust Him, He will actually do things in you. You'll come into certain situations where you'll feel, oh, I can't face this. Tomorrow, I can't face this. There's, some, there's a situation that I can't face at work. I just, I don't know how to do it. I don't know what to do. If you look to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, will you bring about the responses that I need to produce in this situation tomorrow? If you ask Him to do that and put your faith in Him, the Holy Spirit will miraculously bring you through that experience. And if you ask the Holy Spirit to show you what is keeping you back from a deeper closeness to God, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth about those things. So, loved ones, do you see, being a Christian is above all things receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there's no way in which you can be filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized with the Holy Spirit if you haven't at least received the Holy Spirit. You know, I would encourage your hearts if you're sitting there and thinking, Pastor, what do you mean receive? Do you mean I have to have a feeling? No, loved ones, no. You receive Him by faith. And if you say, as I used to say, uh, the intellect rebels against it, doesn't it? The intellect rebels against it. How do I know I've got them if I can't feel them? And yet, faith is believing that God will keep His promise and He will give you the gift of the Holy Spirit as He promised if you will repent in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Then God will give you the Holy Spirit. Now, I wonder if any of you are here this morning who have never received the Holy Spirit. That is, through the way maybe the gospel was preached to you, or through maybe the way you entered into what you felt was becoming a Christian, or maybe you were confirmed in a Lutheran church, or maybe you were baptized in a Baptist church, and you, you really didn't understand what it was about. But somehow or other you feel today you're a Christian and yet you have never ever said quietly to Jesus, Lord Jesus, I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit today. Well then if you haven't done that, and remember I'm not talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit or the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We'll leave that, we'll deal with that later in later Sundays. But just receiving the Holy Spirit as a born-again Christian, if you haven't done that, I frankly think you should just come forward to the altar 
when we have our heads bowed and when the organ is playing, and I'll, I won't even pray out loud. I'll just do what Peter and John did. Do you remember? Peter and John came and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit and laid their hands on them. And that may be what you should do this morning. If you've been feeling, well, the things that you talk about I want to enter into, but really I don't have anything rising within me. I just have a lot of dedication. I don't feel a rising of Jesus within me. Then, loved ones, first receive by faith the gift of the Holy Spirit. Do that first. And then begin to listen to the Holy Spirit as He speaks to you through this coming week and through the coming months and allow Him to lead you on into the fullness and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But first, settle that you're a Christian, that you're one who has received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not just that you're a moral person or that you're a person who has reformed their life or that you're a theist, or a believer in God, or one who is trying to be a good churchgoer. Don't. Put yourself in the position of a New Testament Christian, one who has been baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and who has received the gift of the Holy Spirit by faith. And I'll tell you, if you need to make that move this morning and you make it, the Holy Spirit will change your life. Holy Spirit will change your life. You'll begin to have a voice and a counselor within you that you have never known before. And you'll begin to have the beginnings of a strength and a life and a power within you that will lead you through to victory over even inward sin and will lead you into the fullness and the baptism of the Spirit. So will you decide? Decide if you should do it, you know. And if you believe you should, then I I would counsel that you would just come up and kneel for a, a moment or two, and I would lay my hands on you, and then you should go back, you know, and go back in faith. Because the laying on of hands is simply what Jesus told us to do, and there is no power in me doing that. But it is what Jesus told us to do if we wanted to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And our faith is shown in His words in doing what his words tell us. So that's why we do that, you know. No, there's no power in any man's hands. But we're simply doing what Jesus told us to do if we wanted to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And every time we behave as simple children before him, he gives us all the wonders of his riches. So uh, maybe just as, as uh, Marilyn plays and, and we bow our heads in prayer, Maybe just uh, come up and then, then after I'll pronounce the benediction. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you that you have given us an opportunity this morning to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands as you did it in New Testament times. And so, Lord, we come now and bow before you Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Dear Lord, Savior, Savior, Savior. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ.